Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. Hey, can I just say something about your hair, Mickey? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> You're putting your thumb down. But my th what I want to say about your hair is, you look marvelous. Well, marvelous. Bob, I, I'm... It's green hair, I should say, for our it, listeners. It's I, all green. I'm, uh, I'm modeling a certain senator who is in the doghouse because her tax plan is insane. Who? Uh, Kirsten? Kirsten. And, and uh, I think it looks sort of good. I may adopt this look. Uh, um, does she does she, she sometimes sports green hair? Yes, you and don't she, know that. Uh, I I I get my I get my senators mixed up. It's Mansion never does green she's, hair, right? Do she's I have the that only right? one with He green doesn't hair. do it. She does. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. um, she and the, um, you're saying she's uh, putting her thumb down on it, it on could revenue, start a trend. Well, on tax increases. Basically, what seems to have happened is she's fucking up the whole infrastructure bill. Sorry, Bob, to mention that. Um. The, yeah. the soft infrastructure bill, the big one, the big. We did. Let me just say, we did go one week without leading with this issue, and I, I just want to reflect on that moment. With one day, satisfaction. One day, probably after COVID has receded, we will go a week without mentioning this issue. But um, uh, this is not the week. Uh, the <laughs> sorry. Uh, so she's screwing it all up because she's objecting to the Democratic tax plan, which would raise the rates on individuals and corporations. And Manchin has adopted sort of a much more sensible plan where he says you can raise the corporate rate, but only to this point, I think it was 25%. And you can raise the individual rate, but only to this point. And, and Cinema is having none of that. She wants to replace it at the last minute with a completely different scheme, which would, uh, called mark to market, which would drive the upper class insane. It's basically anytime your stock rises, you have to pay a tax on the increase, uh, even even if you haven't cashed it in. So you invest isn't in that, Tesla. Isn't that kind of like Elizabeth Warren's uh, plan for taxing wealth? It's it's basically it's sort of a backdoor wealth gains. tax. I think. I think yeah, it's a yeah. backdoor wealth tax. Well, and I think it's it's I, I think it's Warren's version of it. It's basically if your if your wealth rises, it doesn't matter whether you realize the gains by cashing in. You still pay a tax on it. Right. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't go back and tax all your pre-existing wealth, but it no. taxes your the rise in, in wealth increases stocks in wealth. every year. And do the, but the problem is, it's, it's sort of asymmetrical. If your stocks go down. Uh, so you pay no taxes and they even go down further. Is the, is the IRS going to send you a check for the amount you've lost? Oh, no, they're not going to. Maybe they'll let you carry it forward. Uh, the loss, but they're not going to send you a check to make up for the amount they took when they taxed your wealth. So uh, it really fucks the rich and it's very complicated. And obviously to introduce this thing, where we'll, we'll, what, what will the rules be for carrying it forward? What are the rules for valuing? At the last minute, there's just never, there's just no time to get that done. So I don't know quite what Kirst, my beloved Kirsten's uh, well, first thinking of all, of. First of all, can we infer from this that she in fact, is not carrying water for rich people in, in, in her resistance to the, the plan for raving, raising revenue. She's carrying water just for corporations. She's still against the corporate. No, you tax. can't infer that at all because she's opposing the plan that would effectively raise taxes on the rich and proposing a plan that seems to be worse for the rich, but will in fact never get done. Well, that's so, what I said. I, I said, She's still defending corporations, but no longer helping rich individuals, right? She's still but against she the is corporate. helping rich individuals because she's opposing the rate hike on individuals. The corporate rate. Wait, wait. Doesn't... I thought you said she was proposing this this wealth tax. She's yeah, but it's not... never going to get done. So it's like a scam. So you could you could easily say she's still defending the risk because the tax she proposed on the rich will never get done. Okay, so, and and your view is that that's clearly what she's up to. She just knows it. No, happen. I don't know what she's up to. I don't know enough about her to know what she's up to. I don't think anybody really knows what she's up to. Clearly, though, she is. You know, when she she came into the House chamber and had a thumbs down on a deciding vote on the minimum wage increase, which was sort mm -hmm. of a silly vote to have a thumbs down on, but it was fifteen dollars. It seemed like a lot at the time. Doesn't anymore. Um, and. Uh, She's clearly priming herself 
modeling herself after McCain, that's what everybody says, to vote against the whole shebang. So she, this idea that the, the White House strategy is to isolate her, she's a crazy woman, we can't deal with her, we'll deal with Manchin, we'll cut a deal with Manchin, then we'll take the whole thing to the floor and dare her to mm -hmm. vote against it. Well, that and may work. Curl Sorry? Because, that may work because she's more vulnerable to being primary than Manchin is. She's the one to do that to, right? I don't think she's that vulnerable to being primary. And she, she clearly, her self image is clearly, I'm the woman who d gives the thumbs down. So fine. I but just, if, she, if she is the reason none of this happens, I can imagine a killer attack ad. There's a lot of stuff in this, even after Manchin has done what he's done to it, I, I assume that, um, you know, that people are going to want. And if there's she's less, the reason none of it happens, I, I see some good attack there, ads here. There's less and less of it every day, Bob. Uh, well, maybe Manchin is getting us to a point where, where they can't put this kind of pressure on her. Well, I mean, so this basically, is, he is he is against uh, new programs and she is against new revenue. Between the two of them, they're kind of a <laughs> problematic part of a, of um, a liberal constituency well, uh, or coalition. I mean, I mean it, it, it's true. Uh, you know, look, you look at what's left of it. I mean, I think tomorrow's CW, Conventional Wisdom, for our British expats over the people across the pond, uh, this, the Conventional this, that's Wisdom That's an tomorrow, obscure reference to uh, something we, in, in the Parrot Room, a commenter, a British commenter complained that we assume too much knowledge on the part of our- Oh, was that only in the Parrot Room? Sorry. It was in um, the Parrot Room. The, uh, things go on in the Parrot Room. What can I say? The, um- the conventional wisdom tomorrow will be, this isn't such a big deal. Even if it passes, the conventional wisdom see, eh, $1.5 trillion over 10 years, not that much money, not doing that much, not going to help Biden that much. What was all the fuss about? I I, I guarantee you that will be the conventional wisdom if this passes yeah, but a month this later. Plus the hard infrastructure, which presumably would be part of the passage, is, is definitely not nothing. Yeah, and, no, it's not and, nothing, but the... But the convention was, oh, this is a big deal, This, especially the soft infrastructure. Biden's presidency rides on it. He's the new FDR. He's going to transform America. Uh, that will be replaced with, well, it didn't really transform America. What, the hard infrastructure is really much more important. But look, look at what's happened, okay? They've kept the child tax credit, which is unpopular, okay, and but only for a year. The child care provision is being attacked by the left for being a total mess that's going to raise child care costs for the middle class by $13,000. So that that's the, daycare for toddlers basically. They want that is that is like a a, a day, making daycare like the school system everybody can get daycare. Okay. So it's pre, it's pre-K it's pre-K or it's pre-pre-K. Do we already have pre-K? It's pre-pre-K. It's pre-pre-K. The pre-K is something different. The pre-K the pre-K uh is is a is a system of federal state cooperation, and a lot of states aren't going to take it. So okay. it's not clear that that's such a big deal. Manchin State is one of the states that has it already. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, you know, because the state share of the funding is so great, a lot of states are going to say no, thank you, sorry, buddy. Uh, the um, so wait, the so community the thing, college thing. Okay, go. Well, I'm just, just going down the list. Let me okay, go down the go list. Down list. Go down the list. The community colleges thing is dead, dead, dead. That's not happening. That that is depressing to me, and the, I think stupid. The parental leave thing has gone down from twelve weeks to four weeks, so it's not all that big a deal. Uh, the dental thing, Medicare thing, they're thinking of giving eight hundred dollar vouchers for dental care, so that's been diminished. So, what is what is going to be so terrible about opposing this uh, emasculated mess? Well, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. There's less pressure on cinema than there would have been before Mansion got through. It, that's for sure. Maybe they're working in tandem. The um, so taking it from the top, so the child tax credit, which you oppose, now would last only a year, and would it be in the form you hate? Uh, that is to say, there's no work requirement or uh, not. It Nobody really knows what's going on there. It looks like it'll be mm -hmm. in the form that I hate. There will be no work requirement. Checks will go to people who don't do any work at all with no breadwinner even in sight, you know, so it's, it's recreating the whole pathology but it, but, of welfare. It, but it expires after a year, so you're not too perturbed. Well, better than after four years, yeah. But um, 
No, I'm, you're I'm getting perturbed, good at, Bob. You're... I'll I reserve the right to be perturbed. But, but Biden very forthrightly said he opposes a work requirement last night in the town hall. But he gave a paragraph defending it that was so incoherent, nobody could figure out what he was trying to say. And just because Biden doesn't want it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But currently, it seems like they're not going to go back to the old system, which you had to make twenty five hundred dollars to get the credit. OK, by the $2, way, twenty five dollars isn't that much. Twenty five hundred dollars at a year. Do you know what the uh, answer is to the question? What does Mickey Kaus have in common with Xi Jinping? With who? Xi Jinping. China's we both, leader. We both look like Winnie the Pooh. We both we're both authoritarians. We both. Uh, Let me tell you what he said this week. "Quote: Even if our level of development is is higher in the future and finances are more abundant, we cannot set too high a goal and have excessive guarantees. We must resolutely guard against falling into the trap of supporting lazy people through welfareism." That's a direct quote. I think you and he should uh, maybe have coffee. That'd be great. Um, he, um, they have a, 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 a worse tradition in China of the iron rice bowl, which basically said you, you got an income and the state can't take it away. Well, it is supposedly communism, isn't it? I would expect as much. What's funny well, is that people still call it a communist nation it, when the only thing communist about it is one word in the name of the party. Uh, well, the party controls it's, it's an authoritarian system now. Right, but I but think it's they're, not they're probably. There are probably still some vestiges of the iron rice bowl. I don't think. But anyway, uh, supposedly Apparently Dung not. got rid of all that mess, right? What? Supposedly no. Dung campaigned against Dung Xiaoping. Remember him? Uh, very campaigned much against so. the iron rice bowl. Look, I'm going to take off this wig because I feel like a Joe Biden appointee. But I you're look getting like so Biden good appointee. at brushing your hair aside. You look like Jen Psaki. It's good. You I should... look like Admiral. I look like Admiral Levine, the the Biden appointee who just got commissioned to be an admiral. Um, it's and a call, Mickey, but I really think uh, I'm going to get canceled like worst. yourself. Well, be the problem is the this thing here. is sort of toxic. How could this green wig not be toxic? Uh, I can so, imagine ways. I know green things that aren't toxic, but uh, it's anyway, your call. I'm going to take it off before it poisons me. Fine. Okay, sorry. Okay, this is the you're big looking reveal. worse and worse and worse. Oh, wait, now that's where you should stop. What's that around your head? Is, is that a Well, when you wear a wig, they base? make you wear a hairnet, Bob. Oh, that's so cool. No, leave it. At, uh, you look like a gangster. No, no. Mickey, my brother, leave it The on. hairnet actually does wonderful things for my hair. I wear it all the time, Bob, when you're not there. Uh, that was, that okay. was a good look. That, that intermediate look was good. Um, so, uh, you know, just quickly on community college, uh, I just think it's a political mistake. Um, I suspect that if you go out into to, uh, swing voter land or moderate Trump voter land or whatever, there's a fair number of people who wouldn't mind having it. And I think it has actual benefits, both because often there's there's a heavy vocational emphasis. So for people who... who uh, aren't going to want to go to four-year college, but would like to get better prepared for the job market and aren't so well prepared right out of high school, it can be a very good thing. And then there's this, these people who are kind of aimless out of high school, don't know what they're going to do, and and uh, might want to go to four-year college, and this becomes the bridge to it. They finally get their shit together, and they go, and after junior college, they go to a, a four-year college. I just think it has a, a lot of benefits, and I don't get this. Um uh I don't quite get it either because the community college lobby is very strong. There's one in every town. That every congressman be. knows the leaders of their local community college. Uh, it, it can't just be that they met a bigger lobby than them. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, people like me have an objection to it because it's, you know, commonly used as an excuse to continue welfare. You go, well, we have to give them welfare if they're training at a community college. So they take some bullshit course at community college and keep the income stream going. Well, is uh, there the such state, a requirement anyway? There, there's not going to be a requirement like that anyway, right? Well, there is in the traditional welfare program, which still exists, uh, TANF, it's called now, uh, and it has about 2 million families in it. So it's not nothing. It's half the size of, of, that it used to be before Clinton reformed it, but it's uh, it still exists. And, and there's always, pre I, you know, the rules were written very tightly to not allow this thing where you you train and get a check. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. They, you know, 
I don't know if Biden has managed to loosen them or not. Uh, but um, and then Medicare dental coverage now has an eight hundred dollar ceiling after Manchin got through with it. Is that right? I I I don't it's I don't think it's coverage. It's just an eight hundred dollar voucher. I don't know. It's not it, it's not incorporated into the regular Medicare program. The the problem with it is, as uh, as Scott Winship of AI put it, uh, it's not like insurance, which is designed for unpredictable events. Uh, you know, you suddenly get a heart attack and you need insurance and Medicare is there for you. And, uh, it's totally predictable that people will need dental care. And all including it in Medicare usually does is drive up the cost uh, by assuring dentists that they're going to get this stream of government money. So why do it? Uh, why not take that? There's really something that you should take care of with, you know, income by ensuring that working people have decent incomes and not by guaranteeing them access to care that's, that's utterly predictable. Same with uh, probably well, same with vision care. Well, but first of all, I don't get how an $800 voucher isn't the equivalent of $800 of, uh, or a ceiling on $800 worth of benefits. I guess because it doesn't become a permanent entitlement welded into the system. So next year, maybe there's not an $800 voucher. Uh, and it's but it, not But like, it's for Medicare recipients, this $800 voucher for dental care. I assume so. I, I don't know if, you know, this is just something Biden mentioned. Nobody really mm -hmm. knows the details. Uh, the, the one thing, it's, it's pretty clear that Biden is on top of the negotiations and also pretty clear that when he's when he doesn't know what he's talking about, he really sounds like he doesn't know what he's talking about. So the, his answer on the work requirement, he was handed some example by some aide and it was all confused and it degenerated into incoherence. But he knows what people have proposed. He knows why he's not pushing the filibuster because it'll cost him three votes. You know, he knows the four issues that they're down to. He knows what Sinema's position is. It's not like he's adulpated. You know what he doesn't know? What America's position on Taiwan is. This, this, we, I was gonna, I was gonna bring that up, Bob, but you're used to get to cut off our discussion of infrastructure. Well, it is an endlessly fascinating subject. And, and, it, uh, so I actually uh, didn't have that much more to say about it. So let's go to Taiwan. Okay. He said we have a commitment to defend Taiwan. Yeah. He said, yeah. Somebody asked, and he said, yes, we do have a commitment to do that. What's funny is that in a, around 2002, George Bush, made the same kind of slip up. And Biden wrote a whole piece, a whole uh, op-ed attacking him and explaining what the one China policy is and the value of strategic ambiguity. And you mean an op-ed appeared that had Joe Biden's name on it? Absolutely. And I think it was the Washington Post. Somebody put it right, on Right, but on the Twitter. point is, but you said Biden wrote it. I deny Biden wrote it. Okay, maybe Tony Blinken wrote it, but I mean, surely Biden knew it came out. He was conversant at that point. And, you know, he was pretty conversant in foreign policy stuff at one point. You keep saying every time you see him, gosh darn it, he's sharp, sharp as attack. I keep saying he's in <laughs> obvious decline, and there keeps being evidence that he's in obvious decline. You don't think this was a, a, a an actual decision by his staff saying China is now threatened enough, we really have to hint at them? that we will defend Taiwan? Well, this happened pretty recently. Well, I, I don't know if they've walked it back. I guess that would tell us, but- um, They haven't know, really it, had time to walk it, it back. It, it's a bad time to be giving China new reasons uh, to worry. We Both sides have been giving each other plenty of reasons to worry. China, and you know, there was just this report this week that China tested this new missile that has freaked everyone out. Uh, mainly because they don't understand nuclear deterrence. Um, well, we'll get to that. But what what is the correct answer? Your president, right? Somebody asked you this question. What do you say? Well, the official answer of, of basically all presidents, including Bush, once he got straightened out on it, is to is to fuzz it up and not say we are committed to it, but not rule it out. To say something. No, vague. no, no. I, I understand that, but what do what are the exact words to fuzz it up? I, I, I don't know exactly like what it is, but it, but you know, it's called strategic ambiguity. You don't rule it out. Uh, you might say all options are on the table or something. That's a classic way of of including military force in the range of options without committing to it. Um, it it's a weird policy that you know, was basically created uh, by Nixon and Kissinger with one China by 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 saying to, to China, yeah, we'll respect your views on Taiwan uh, by uh, basically 
having you take Taiwan's seat is, in the isn't United this, Nations. Isn't this policy just as ambiguous since nobody really knows if Biden will follow through on it? Um, well, it, it it's it's at least as uh, as a, as much of a deterrent to China, I guess. The question is, does it lock him into trying to defend Taiwan if push comes to shove? And also, I, I mean, I, I suppose I can imagine ways that that all of this stuff going on collectively from both sides, the kind of escalation now, you know, like. We learned, you mentioned this thing that I was not aware of at the time about our having put uh, special forces in Taiwan. Well, it turns out that happened under Trump, but we it was just disclosed. Well, that's like a, that's like a big line to cross. Having technically, we now have troops in Taiwan. That's like super new. And well, Biden hasn't pulled them out. What's that? Biden presumably has not pulled them out. Or no, maybe I has. don't think he has. That's what I'm saying. I mean, there are things from both sides that are freaking out the other. Um, it, this may be more of a deterrent, but of course, uh, it, it also locks Biden more into getting into a war with Taiwan if it comes to that. And I think that's a losing proposition. In the end, we just lose, okay? Even if we manage for five years to fend them off, we, we're, we're either going to lose or we're going to have a nuclear war. China is not, is not going to, going to, uh, take no for an answer. Ultimately. What about I mean, the possibility that, what about the possibility that if we hold him off for five years, that's so humiliating to Xi that his government will collapse? You mean hold him off militarily? Look, I do think there's hope. Oh, you're thinking if, of, you're thinking of holding him off, not militarily. Right. I, I think we should try to keep kicking the can down the road, which we've been doing oh. for more than half a century now. And I was thinking you were, you were making the argument that we would Right now, we would beat them militarily, but in five years, they're going to be so strong that there's no way. It would be a mess even right now. I mean, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, the joke used to be before their military buildup that if they invaded Taiwan, their strategy would be the million man swim, right? Well, those days are gone. I mean, they they have like they're developing a real Navy and uh, it would it would get messy. And for us to, you know keep supplying, you know, it's a lot closer to China than to us, and they care a lot more about it. And that's why even if we prevailed in the first military conflict, uh, it's just, I just don't think there's any way you prevail in the wrong one, in the long run. I mean, that would be, uh, that would be unsustainable politically for the leader of Taiwan to just accept that kind of defeat. You got to understand the Chinese people, uh, you know, by and large, I think a majority strongly support the idea that Taiwan is part of China. Right. It, but if you're if you're a president right and you say what you said now, it becomes clear to the world we're not going to defend Taiwan and the Chinese just walk in and do it, right? Well, you don't say all that if you're president right. You just every time somebody <laughs> asks you, you like mumble and change the subject. That's yeah. what Biden was supposed to do. Um, the uh, What about the, this missile? I guess. Why isn't it scary? Because we still have MAD? Yeah, I mean, okay, so it's a missile that, uh, you know, right now we have this uh, missile defense system in, in Alaska. Okay, so to go, let's go further back. Sorry. During long ago, both the Soviet Union and the United States had the wisdom to recognize that missile defenses are actually a bad thing because they undermine deterrence if they start making one side worry that the other side, you know, could actually fend off a nuclear attack. Then they worry about the other side launching one. And so they, they, they build more nuclear weapons and so on. We, we both realize that, that missile defense systems lead to just accelerate the arms race, make, make deterrence less stable, uh, you know, increase the chance of nuclear war. So we, we, we did the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Uh, George W. Bush in 2002 got out of the treaty and built a missile defense system in Alaska. Pr- prior to that, we had been confined by the treaty to like building one around D.C. and they built one around Moscow, something like that. Um, so he builds one in Alaska. And I guess people started imagining, nobody imagined that could fend off a Soviet threat, but they have, you know, as many warheads as we do roughly. But 
I guess some people imagined that it could fend off a, a, a Chinese threat, which was total bullshit. It couldn't. It, it's it's not. You know, they, they have. Uh, well, so then it's not destabilizing. Yeah, the new missile is not destabilizing because we no no then the then the then the missile defense is not destabilizing if it can't if it can't defend against the Chinese threat and only defends against the lone madman like uh, like Korea then uh, then how is it destabilizing? It, it is the probably can be secure and that right. they're not going to be defended against. It is probably small enough and porous enough that it by itself is not very destabilizing, although you'd have to ask the Chinese. It's their perception that matters right. in a case like this. But the main thing is that given the fact that they're like 100 or whatever nuclear uh, missiles could easily overwhelm this, as, as Jeffrey Lewis pointed out in a piece in Foreign Policy after this thing happened, um, we never had a sustainable missile defense. Okay, so the thing about this new missile is it could in principle circumvent if they deployed it if they put nuclear warheads on it you know they tested it it could in principle circumvent the alaska defenses by uh you know going up into orbit around the south pole and coming down and and doing whatever and this has people freaked out but we would still have you know a, an overwhelmingly credible deterrent which is all we have now okay so it doesn't fundamentally change anything. The, the, the one thing you might want to do in response to this is continue to enhance our space-based uh, sensors, you know, surveillance, so we know for sure if anybody's putting a missile into outer space, because that's where this goes. It goes into low orbit. Do, doesn't it shorten the time? Can't they now hit Washington in a minute and a half or something? No, it doesn't get there faster. That's the funny thing, is that the existing missiles get there faster. So it doesn't, I mean, as I understand it, Currently, but the um, certainly if it goes over the South Pole, it doesn't. I mean, everybody's saying it's hypersonic. Well, I, I we there are missiles this. I gather that there are ballistic missiles that are this fast. But if it goes over the South Pole, it it, it takes longer to get there. Now you have pointed to the one thing that could destabilize deterrence. If this uh, either because we can't detect it happening or because it gets there so fast, uh, makes it harder for us to launch on warning right. of, of a nuclear assault than it is now, that would be worth worrying about. But again, space-based sensors, are, are, you know, which we already have, but maybe we need more of those or something. And of course, there's always the possibility of trying to just do a treaty that saves us all a lot of trouble. But I will say that right now, you know, China, if anyone has to worry about not being secure from a nuclear attack through the logic of deterrence, it's not us in the Soviet Union. It is China. And in all probability, that's what motivates these kinds of developments. They, they want to develop a stronger retaliatory capacity. What? what uh, that do we launch on warning now? Defense. Do we launch on warning now? Well, we say we're willing to. But you got to remember, we have... You know, we have submarines with nuclear weapons. So like, so nobody could imagine that they could like wipe out. I mean, I mean, if they wiped right. out all of America, you know that a few captains of a few submarines right. would hear about it and go, look, no. <laughs> we're going to torch you guys. You no, know? I understand. But but it doesn't. This, but but this yes, I think I think our professed policy is that we would be willing to launch okay. on uh, if there were incoming missiles. But that is our is, professed policy. Isn't this then destabilizing because we'll be much more paranoid about any possible warning? Well, we see that little streak there. Is that a missile or not? Well, they have this new fancy missile. Maybe we're maybe we're not evading, not noticing this missile, so we launch. If it, I mean, if it, 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 it makes it more likely that we will launch on warning because we're not sure that we have actually going to catch this hypersonic missile. If it got here faster, which it doesn't. That, then that would be the case. No, and it's if, a different and if signature. We didn't, it's like and if we're, we used, didn't, we're used to the signature of ballistic missiles, and it's a different signature, so we're paranoid. Well, that's why I said. That's, that's why I said the one thing you might want to do is uh, continue to enhance our space-based uh, sensor or surveillance because it flies in low orbit. That's what it does. That's what's distinctive about it. It, it goes all the way up to low orbit. But it just seems. It, it seems like. We should be. It is a troubling development because it it okay. makes us more trigger happy. My main point, and I wrote about this in the non-zero newsletter Hair that trigger. will go out today. My okay. main point is a bunch of people like Rich Lowry of National Review, who was the one I pick on in this piece in non-zero non-zero newsletter, saying 
We have to enhance missile defense. We have to enhance our offensive capabilities. None of that makes any sense. The one thing they're saying that makes sense, aside from maybe we should do more in the way of arms control treaties, is uh, this, our sensing mechanisms in outer space. Okay? Fine. That's good. Nothing else they're saying even makes sense. Okay? It made me want to move to Idaho, but that's just me. Well, that might be a good policy now. Um, we, we, uh, I say concentrate all your Trump voters in, in one state. I, I think well, they should I, the, all the, move the, to Idaho. The thing, I, I don't want to move to Idaho because that's such a cliched choice for a Trump voter. Although the, there is the movement for greater Idaho, which would basically have Idaho expand to encompass most of the Western United States. I was sort of hoping it would get down south and take off a bunch of the San Fernando Valley so I could move to Idaho just by driving for 15 minutes. But, um, uh, Idaho is probably a bad idea. I think and plus Mitchell, I wouldn't, South I wouldn't Dakota, wear that green wig in Idaho either. Yeah. If I were you. You'd be surprised. Mitchell, South Dakota was always my idea of a nice, nice American town to move to. They have a corn palace. Hmm. Can't be you um, mean made of corn or just all you can eat corn. I think it's a bit of a fraud. It's supposedly made of corn, but in fact, it's just a wooden building with a yeah. bunch of corn tacked on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's all you can eat corn inside. I haven't gone into it. It's very okay. tacky looking. It looks satisfyingly tacky. Anyway, the search is on by Hollywood yuppies for nice American towns to move to so they can raise their kids uh, cheaply and and just uh, write their scripts speaking and come, of to, which, come to L.A. Every, once every year. What? Speaking of which, you heard about that weird Alec Baldwin thing, right? Yeah, I don't quite understand it. Uh I mean, so he, do, shot, why, he why, accidentally why, shot and killed his cinematographer. Right. But why does a and it's very annoying. They 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 say Baldwin kills woman. Well, it was his cinematographer. It wasn't just like a random woman. Uh, and uh, she's presumably has achievements and now she's dead. But uh, he should, the he obvious should, question it, is, that, that's worse than killing a woman without achievements. It's just sort of an insult. It's like when your obituary comes and it says, you know, uh, you know, um, Princeton man dies, okay? You would want more than that, right? Yeah, I would want man with achievements dies. Yeah, they should have said Baldwin kills woman with achievements. Kills no, his but, cinematographer. That just makes it a much more oh, dramatic story. No, I, I did see it reported that way. But the, the weird thing is, I thought they'd quit using... Uh, so apparently it had a live round in it. I assumed the idea was that it would shoot blanks. Uh, but I I heard on the radio this morning that uh, they had pretty much quit using guns that shoot blanks in, in studios because that can kill you if you put it like, like it has a discharge. And in fact, right. a guy was killed on a film set by a gun that actually had a blank in it several decades ago and everybody quit using them. So I don't know. Was that the was guy who got on. killed in The Crow, the movie The Crow? I don't know. And I don't know if it's the son of Bruce Lee, who also is... I think died on a set from a gunshot wound, but, um, uh, and those may be the same. So all, so the focus is on the props guy who, who put the bullet there, right? Now you saw J, did you see JD Vance's, um, well, who knows? Look, it may not have been the props guy. Might, might've been some crazy person sabotaging, right. you know, uh, who knows? I, I'm sure they'll look into it. Did, but then wouldn't Baldwin have immediately said that? I don't think he said anything yet. If, I mean, he's yeah, he probably he was, pretty freaked out. He said words cannot express. There are no words. He said that. Well, that's probably true. I, I, I didn't quite understand J.D. Vance's tweet. Yeah, he was pretty jovial. Well, well, what he said was, uh, Jack, Jack, Jack Dorsey of Twitter, let Trump back on. We need Alec Baldwin tweets. He, he What he means is he wants to, I think he wants to see, it's a joke. He's like joking about this tragedy, which I think is pretty weird. Uh, but, um, and I'm curious as to your view, but- uh, It I seemed he, weird to me. That's why I wanted more context. No, I I, I think it's- Hoping it's it would clear. get him off the hook. I think he means he. it would be funny to see Trump go to town on Alec, because Alec Baldwin famously did the, the Trump impersonation on Saturday Night Live. I always thought it was a bad impersonation. I didn't get why everybody drooled all over it, but um, I think that's the joke. He'd love to see Trump uh, getting all uh, uncouth in, in the wake of a tragedy. And in the course of this, of course, J.D. Vance himself gets pretty damn uncouth in the wake of a tragedy. Seems pretty weird. Um, well, that... He has people who write his tweets for him, maybe. 
I don't know. That's one excuse. Or maybe he should. Uh, uh... He didn't know the tweet was loaded. He's um, he's gaining in the polls. Uh, I think you predicted that he was dead meat a while ago, didn't you? And he's only three points behind Mandel, who's falling rapidly. So, uh, or did you just pick he wouldn't win the general? But uh, I age. You don't remember things you've done. You you'll have to go find the videotape. That's pretty convenient, Bob. What did you say? My, that's why. S- sorry, my hearing's acting up. What'd you say? <laughs> God. Okay. That's an. Uh, there's a as big an admission of error as you're going to get out of Bob. Now today. I know. I honestly, I, I did. I do think I. I, I predicted, I, I but I think I predicted he wouldn't be president. I could have predicted he won't even survive. He won't even do well in this. I think uh, you said something like he's race. through. He's fading. He's dead. Is this governor or senate? The, the for anything, race. you predicted his career was over. You no, no, but I mean, what's, out. I mean, what's he running for? Senate. Uh, he's well, running he's, for senate, and he has to beat this unpleasant man Mandel, which he's in the process of doing. And then he has to beat a fairly credible Democrat, but it's not a Democratic state anymore. So he's running against someone more unple- more unpleasant than himself. Way more unpleasant than himself. He's he's a pleasant person. This oh, yeah? tweet is an aberration. Have you seen his latest? Oh no, he's always doing he, well. He usually isn't doing tasteless stuff. He's doing uh, obvious, uh, you know, uh, trolling and uh, what's the word for for debasing yourself by playing trust, abjectly? Trust to, me, to as soon as he tribe. wins the primary, he'll he'll become a pleasant person. I think. Did you he's say that inherent, about Trump? He's, he's a very very appealing candidate. I think you said that those very words about Trump in 2016. Did you not? Uh, I may have thought them. I probably said them at some point. Yeah. <laughs> well, how that did that would be, work out? <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, that didn't work out too well. But um, did you see Trump's uh, new Twitter? Did you see the new Trump social media thing? He's got his the, own- the bizarre thing is that all these people are investing all this money in him, which 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 it seems like you're just it's a disguised form of campaign uh, uh, campaign donation. But this raises the next issue, which I wanted to raise, which is w- what do we do with Trump? I mean, the key the key event was this poll by Ann Seltzer, who is a god among pollsters. She's has the best reputation of any pollster in America. She's almost always right. And she had Trump tying Biden. If the election were held now, would you vote for Biden or Trump? Each tied at 40. And that sort of stunned some people because, you know, it, it they didn't think Biden was doing that badly. And they certainly didn't think Trump would be the alternative. And that's going to that's going to make it very hard to talk Trump out of the race. So I was thinking, uh, you know, and we could talk about this in in the this was my big paradigm topic. So I don't want to bring it all up now. But how do you talk Trump out of the race? Maybe you bribe him by, like, letting him start this new network that makes him millions of dollars and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so they, that in that sense, the new network would be encouraging, except it's going to flop. So I think Jack Schaefer wrote a column about it, which I haven't read, but I'm sure it was persuasive about why it's going to flop. I'm not sure I'd trust him on this question of how uh, on social media uh, ventures. I, I can imagine it. It's not going to become Twitter. It's never going to have the blue tribe on it, but that doesn't mean it can't be viable as this conservative social media thing. Now, it's not auspicious that it got hacked right away. And so for a while, Trump's own pinned tweet. Did you see that? That was disgusting even by my standards. It was like a pig taking a dump. (laughs) It was like, it was worse than that sounds. It was worse than that sounds. It was like, I don't want to get into it. It was like- It it wasn't the famous- it wasn't the famous image that got Mike Kinsley's wiki, wiki editorial project killed at the L.A. Times. I don't know. What was that? <laughs> it, it It's sort of very not safe for work. It's it's a famous the something image. I think it starts with a G and it involves it, it involves looking up somebody's anus. No, this is an actual pig from behind with seemingly. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to go into it, but oh, let's just it, was say, just, it was just the pig. Okay. 
Yeah, well, not just the pig. Uh, also, the pig's most recent creation exactly it was as emerge as is, it was. Isn't emerging. this uh, isn't this just like on White Lotus every night? I don't know. I, I all I know is the phrase "White Lotus." It's it's like so many uh, cultural reference. I know I should know what it means. I don't know what it means. I think White Lotus had had actually had like a as part of the the show was it involved some guy taking a dump, uh, and the question was. My friend Daly said, was it CGI or was it real? We don't know. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't know. I don't watch decadent things. Now, like now um, can I say a little more about Trump? Yes, I have some more, too. Go ahead. Well, maybe yours makes sense going next. Who knows? My point is, you know, Lowry's column was how we can beat Trump in the primaries. And as we've discussed, it's not enough to beat Trump in the primaries because he's not going to concede defeat and he's going to sabotage the election. This is so Rich, Rich a, Lowry wrote this. Rich Lowry wrote this. So if you want, if you don't want Trump to fuck up the election, you have to get him not to run in the first place. And that means you have to start acting quickly. I mean, there's all this, this idea in Republicans that uh, at the last minute, we're all going to mass and we're all going to denounce Trump and he's going to drop out. No, you have to start chipping away at him right now. Uh, and every person who comes out saying tr we, we love Trump, but he shouldn't run and, and, and sort of makes him realize he doesn't have a wall of support and somehow convinces him not to run is needed right now. Or at least at least after the midterms, right after the midterms. Well, how do you organize this campaign? Who, who is willing to start it off? I've started it. And how's the contagion working for you there? Is that uh, is pretty much everyone infected with a desire to do this? <laughs> well, it's only been like a few days. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, don't underestimate underestimate my power. No, nah, no, nah, I didn't mean to Despite scoff. Despite being shadow banned by Twitter. Didn't mean to scoff. I have 405 blue check marks who, who read me. Um, so uh, let's see where to begin. Well, well, first of all, on Trump, you know. There actually was, there actually was a, a congressman, I think, who, who who jumped on the bandwagon. You not just my forget the person's, you just forget the person's name. It's not, he's not so famous that I remember his name, yeah. Um, but he's not, I don't think he's one of the traditional never Trumpers. So, so my thought on Trump, well, first of all, as you know, Steve Bannon, uh, is uh, Congress has voted to hold him in contempt. Um, there is no greater favor you could do him, I think, than give him reason to call himself a political prisoner of the deep state. Um, but that seems to be where that is headed and kind of relatedly, um, I mean, that, that, that's an interesting case because, you know, his claim is executive privilege. Now, Trump is claiming executive privilege on a few fronts of, of not giving things to this committee. Um, and, and, and it's questionable how strong that claim is since Trump is no longer president. Bannon's claim would seem to be the most dubious since he was not even in the administration when the communications with Trump took place. So it's not even intra-administration communication, be all that as it may. Um, I, I listened to a podcast with Bob Wood Woodward and Bob Costa about their new, you know, the Trump book where the big excerpt was about the the Milley, you know, phoning his Chinese counterpart and, and, and so on. Right. Um, what they were talking about, and, and granted, you know, they're plugging a book, and 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 Woodward's inclined to to uh, perhaps over dramatize things. But even if you discount by thirty percent, what I took very seriously was Costa saying that first of all, near the end, you know, uh, from the election through January six, Trump was quite engaged in trying to overturn the election. I mean, the night. At midnight, January 5th, they were trying to, to get Pence to accept a, a visit uh, from Rudy Giuliani to his home to, to make a last appeal. And, and, <laughs> and in general, um, you know, what, what Costa said, which worries me, and, and, I, and I had said to you before that, look, a, a new Trump presidency would be scarier because Trump did learn some things. I mean, at first he was just totally, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a puppet of various forces he didn't understand. 
very easy to manipulate. And what Costa says is you can see that by the end of the term, he understands more about how to use the levers. And near the very end, he's deeply engaged in, in this thing. And, uh, and you know, but for the, the whatever reason, the steely will of Mike Pence, we might have had a true constitutional crisis. You might have had a vice president who said, yeah, what the hell? I'll do this. And then who knows where that leads. Now, um, I don't I don't think it would be have been successful in the end, but it would. Have no, been but it, well, look, but, it would be this huge constitutional crisis regardless. Right. But but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the this January 6th committee, at least Liz Cheney, seemed to be pursuing a uh, an extreme version of this theory which is that Bannon was the key link through which Trump communicated with the demonstrators. And not only that, but that the plan was to actually use violence to stop the vote and let that somehow this was going to aid. It wasn't just, you know, convince Mike Pence. Everybody knows that you convince you, that Trump tried to convince Mike Pence, but that's not violent. That's just, you know, he's trying to argue with Mike Pence. Uh, and the people on the mall are just sort of there yelling and chanting to pressure Mike Pence. But but Cheney charges, and, and she seems to exaggerate, but in the Woodward book, that seems to be what Milley believed was that it was an attempt to violently overthrow the government by storming the Capitol and forcing this vote. And that seems insane to me, and it seems unbelievable that Milley would believe it. And if he did believe it, he seems that seems sort of crazy. Uh, uh, and I, I, I don't trust Cheney at all on this, but it's it's sort of shocking that that maybe this is in the Woodward book that Millie really believed that it was a violent putsch. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, look, it, it, on the one hand, it wasn't very well organized if it was um, the the uh, but I will say as as far as Bannon's role, I mean, remember at the you know, when this happened and and all through the run up to the election, I was making a habit of listening to Bannon's podcast, and and I recounted to you on this podcast some things Bannon had said on the podcast uh, the day before and the day of, and, and and said, you know, I really think people don't appreciate he is the clearinghouse for the uh, overturn the election movement. He's more important than people realize. People were kind of some people were like, like, what's your obsession with the Bannon podcast? He was hugely influential. And, you know, and there was uh, just this week a New York Times piece quoting some things he had said uh, the night before the day before on his podcast. And as I told you, this was a podcast I listened to and literally thought they better have a battalion at the Capitol tomorrow. But but the things they quoted were even more militant than I remembered. It was like we are at the point of attack the point of attack tomorrow all hell is going to break loose it's going it's not going the way you think it, there, there was you know and just all this vaguer this that, is lexington rhetoric um with that it, but he is he does have a penchant for sure overdoing it with military m metaphors sure, but, i mean i remember when he took over breitbart he said it's good to after leaving the white house he said it's good to have my hands back on my weapons i mean everything's a weapon to him and it's all this well, military bullshit and uh what 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 that you know? What nobody has shown is that this. I agree that it, that's totally hyperventilating, but there was even a piece in the post that said, in context, it's not that bad. He's and what wasn't going to go as expected was that Pence was going to vote not to not to approve the delegates from various states. So uh, uh, that that would you know that we don't know which what he meant, but there's no real hard evidence that he meant. Violence, and, and I do think we sh the the committee should get all of his emails and communications and documents so we know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. But Cheney is sort of leaping to the conclusion that because he wants to protect the documents, uh, he must be guilty of the worst possible crime. Well, did she apply that to her father when her father claimed executive privilege? Oh, that means he must have started the war to please Halliburton and raise his uh, pension. I mean, you know, no. Well, this so, is a, this uh, is a more dubious claim, I think. But the, um, I mean, a couple of things. But it's a claim that Millie seems to have believed. That's so so bizarre. Okay, a couple of things. I mean, uh, first of all, I think Bannon has shown that he is, um, you know, a deeply. I, I think he's shown that he's a deeply dangerous person. 
He is willing to mislead people. He's completely dishonest. And I am like a Bannon scholar. You know how many hours I put in listening to his podcast, which I only, only quit doing after January. The, the, um, uh, he is deeply dishonest, perfectly willing to mislead gull gullible and vulnerable people about how much evidence there is that the election was stolen, clearly, demonstrably, manifestly willing to consciously, knowingly mislead them. Um, well, if, if he ramped up Trump, that's bad enough. Well, no, but but, but uh, seems okay, to have done. But let me I'll get to that. I, I, well, let, let me say right now. Um, well, well let, let, let me say, the, the, you know, in, in looking at the role he played, Bannon played in revving up the crowd, which included the, the podcast the day of January 6th, he's using what I didn't understand at the time was QAnon vocabulary, the light and the dark. The lightness needs to prevail to, to, to these people. That's like a signal. It means, okay, the apocalypse is here. You know, that, that poor woman who was shot by the cop while, yeah. while trying, you know, she's a classic victim of that kind right. of rhetoric. And Bannon was knowingly repeating it without using the word QAnon. And just in terms of his present and future scariness uh, and past scariness, remember, as I, as I noted at the time, well before the election, he was recruiting people to serve as poll watchers, and these are the very people who made crazy-ass claims about what they had seen that even though they weren't strong enough to ever be introduced into court, so far as I know, at least Giuliani could say, we have affidavits, we have affidavits. And, and so he did that, and now what he's doing is recruiting people to run for office um, at the state and, and county level um, to corrupt future elections. Okay. The, the, I, I just, he, he's a deeply bad person and, and well, go ahead. He recruited the poll watchers before the election or after the election? No, no, the poll watchers. Oh, before, before, as I told you at the time, Bannon is, is getting these and he was using language. Oh, he was saying, this is going to be a rumble. This is going to be a rumble. We need our people in these positions. He was recruiting the very people who made the dubious claims that gave this thing fuel in the eyes of Trump supporters. We have an affidavit with this person saying that they saw a van pull up, you know, and now he's recruiting people to actually run uh, for, for office, uh, you know, the, to, to become the people who will have actual influence over what happens in the next election. Okay. And the, 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 the problem is that those those down low offices, you, nobody pays attention to them, so you can take them over with a with a small intense faction. Probably, probably quite true. And in some of these red states, you can take over state level uh, secretary of state with enough Trump Trumpist uh, support. And uh, the last thing I'll say is just now that we realize the role Bannon played, which you know I kind of thought all along in 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 revving up the crowd on January sixth. It would be interesting to see any communications between him and Trump and to see in which direction things were going. What was it? Was it more ban? And, you know, I mean, was Trump oh, yeah. helping to call plays or what? This becomes very this becomes something the American people deserve to know. Oh, I, I thought they deserved to know it all along. That's 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 why I think the January 6th committee is a is a good thing. Uh, if they get all that information and we finally found out the truth about what happened. But there, there's still the. um there's still the David Cole Stein question, which is what was supposed to happen? I mean, I, I sort of, uh, you know, how, what was their plan by which storming the Capitol unarmed was going to result in overturning the election? I mean, uh, if you assume uh, that Pence doesn't go along, there's no right. way it, well, it, remember, there's no way it happens. Remember until January 5th, well, until as of midnight, January 5th. Right. When they wanted Rudy to go over, they were still hopeful that Pence would fold. Trump had but his the, meeting with Pence, I think, on January 5th, and they didn't give up then, even when Pence said no. So but the people storming the Capitol weren't were they all aware of that, that it was all up to Pence? And, and, and how, how did they play? How, how did they play one way or the other? Well, if Pence what votes for them, if that Pence votes their way, he doesn't need them. If Pence votes against them, all they can do is hang him. Well, first they're of all, they're not going to reverse the decision. First of all, as I so, how does it overturn the election? Well, one one thing before I answer that question, as I recall, Trump 
told the crowd, kind of gave him the impression it's all up to Mike Pence, even though he knew Pence, what Pence was going to do at that point. So he could be seen as priming the crowd to react violently uh, at the Capitol or, or could be seen that way. But but the, in terms of what they had in mind, one thing you got to appreciate about Bannon is, you know, he's like, he's like, uh, he just never gives up. Okay, he's like a quarterback who like minute and a half left, they're down by seven touchdowns. And he's like, okay, here's the way this is going to work. You know, he just like <laughs> never says die. I, I mean, I saw him moving the goalposts the whole time. He, you know, after the election, it's like, okay, the worst case scenario is is X. And then it turned out that that couldn't even happen. And, he, and he's like, okay, here's the worst case scenario. And, and he kept assuring people Trump would remain president. He kept saying that. And he's just a guy who, okay, this didn't work, but we still got this crowd and they haven't voted in Congress yet. I mean, that's the way he thinks. Now, um, and, I don't and know. What, what, is he in it for the money or why is he doing it? That's because he in it for the attention. That's just the way he is. I think he's something of a true believer. If you, if you watch the uh, Errol Morris documentary with him, which everyone should do, called American Dharma, um, there's a moment, there are a bunch of moments. There's a couple of times when he says, there's going to be a revolution. And he means it. But there's there's also this moment where uh, he says, you know, I was, I think the deal is I was at West Point. My daughter's on the volleyball team or something. And I looked at this box full of equipment. And you know what it said on it? I hope I'm getting the story right, but I think so. And you know what it said on it? Made in Vietnam. And you so could tell, what? made in Vietnam. And you could right. tell that for him, this was a genuinely, this had been a genuinely powerful moment. I almost thought he was going to cry. I mean, he's a guy who, you know, he, he has a genuine political ideology and he thinks it's so important that it is worth subverting the government over. He's, he's trying to stage a coup against a fucking pope, Mickey. He really is. He's got an alternative pope of the Catholic Church he's pushing, okay? I mean, the guy has serious aspirations for overthrowing shit, okay? It's like... It's, Next, he's going to go after CAA. That'll be really No, he's, he's, um, not he, he's eccentric, but not crazy, Mickey. He's, 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 he's past his Hollywood phase. Um, uh, Okay, did he did he serve during Vietnam? Was he in the Coast Guard during Vietnam or the Navy or he something? He was he was an officer in the Navy. Um, yeah, I don't know when exactly it was, but it could well be. Uh, get, how old is he? Yeah, he could could have been during Vietnam, and that could account. Because I this. think if you really think the Vietnam War was stupid, you think signs that Vietnam is being incorporated into the world economy are actually good. Plus, they're a counterweight to China, so I, that box would not disturb people. I wouldn't think, but. Well, I don't know. It, it could be, hey, wait, I fought these people and now they're, you know, or, or it could be, yeah, the war. Who knows what he was thinking? It, he's he's an intense. I could go he on. He's intense. He, he, he's into. And you see like him react. You know, they uh, Errol Morse plays his favorite new movie, uh, 12 O'Clock High, just about his favorite. You see him react to these scenes, you know, like this is the moment, you know. Uh, it, 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 he, he he's he, he he's uh well no. he's intense uh not the band and i knew you did know him you should get in touch with him i work for him i know you should get in touch with him you could have a job in the new regime and you could spare me when i'm when they're leading me to the guillotine after the revolution you could put in a good yeah, word um, for me you better play your cards i'm, right, I'm working on if it you want that knew him i vented him no, I wrote for him. Uh, do, do I just you, wrote two articles for him. But um, how many interactions have you had with him? Mm, direct interactions. Well, like a and I, I'm physically a, in his presence. Or a, a physical, and then B digital. Three or four physical. Wow. Add a couple of digital. You know, he. I. You know, people say, "Hey, Steve said publish your article." You know, he approved every article at Breitbart. Mm -hmm. Steve told us to go right ahead and print whatever you want, whatever you write. But I didn't talk to him. I just saw him. So f I, I guess four physical interactions and, uh, you know, a, a bunch more hearing through the grapevine what he said. Uh, 
But I, I, I never had that reaction that he was what he's turned out to be. I always thought he was just a investment banker turned radical who, you know, who would be mean. And he's actually less mean than I thought, but crazier than I thought. Yeah, I, I think he has actual beliefs, you know, unlike Trump. I mean, or much more than Trump. I mean, he's not. I just thought, he, you know, investment bankers under the skin, they're all assholes. So, so one day the asshole will come out, but that's not what's come out. What's come out is something. No, he, he's more weirder. Into, it's complicated. You know, he sees his father as a victim of the global economy and everything. There's a lot of stuff. By the way. So. I, so we're, we've. Oh, we, we had promised to set a. We had said we should set uh, an alarm that gives us. A heads up. Oh, it's exact. We're at exactly an hour, Mickey. We should. I know. Uh, anything else you want to say? I discovered where the call. Well, the only the, the other big thing that was on my uh, list. There's some more to, about China that which we can go into in the parrot room. Nothing huge. Um, what's happening with the virus? I don't understand it. Uh, uh, why are the, the 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 counts are increasing in places like Britain and Russia? But it doesn't seem to be a new variant. What then? What is it? Is it the vaccines are wearing off? I'm sort of alarmed because I realize it's more than six months since I was vaxxed. Well, you don't have to worry. The the, uh, the 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 I mean, you are. That does mean you're more likely to get the disease than you were three months ago. But apparently, you're no more likely to get a serious version. No more likely to be hospitalized. No more likely to die, so far as I can tell. Really? I haven't seen that, but okay. I think that's with, with Pfizer and Moderna, at least, I think there's, there's, uh, I think there's pretty good evidence of that. Um, well, I, that's why I'm I hear about porn. a drugstore where you can go get the Moderna now and I'm thinking of going there. You can also mix and match. So let you mix and match. Um, the, uh, the, the thing I'm puzzled by is that as the case rate continues to drop in the United States, the death rate seems to have plateaued. It's it's very weird. And it's been going on for a while. Right. And why hasn't the death rate gone down faster? And why isn't the case rate going down faster? I mean, California is one of the best states and it's it's plateaued. It's not well, the, it's stopped going down. Well, the nationwide case rate continues to go down. But again, the death rate for a week now hasn't. And that's just weird because, you know, three, four, five, you know, it's been, go the case rate's been going down and the death rate should be an echo of that three weeks later or so. And, you know, so it's, it's stuck between 1600 and 1700 a day right now, which is, you know, higher um, than you would like. I know. Well, okay. So we don't have an answer. It's the answer. No, but we can discuss this more in the pair room. Um, what else? Uh, so, Parrot Room. Uh, let's see. Um, what What do you want to talk about in the parrot? We've covered We've covered sort of too much ground, but I have uh, what did what Dave Chappelle said about Mike Pence, uh, which nobody is talking about. Okay. Um, we have. Uh, 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 Garland's conflict of interest, which we can talk about. We have, uh, I want to talk about what would the, uh, you know, what would a, a package that would actually bribe Trump into leaving the race look like? And is it possible? Uh, the answer is no, but I'm interested that. in hearing about your package. Um, and uh, I'm not going to take you up on that, Bob. Uh, uh, the role of death threats in politics is that now is that now a big concern? Uh, um, don't know. I can give you. I can always give you more car advice and talk about the Velvet Underground. Well, I want to talk about the car. I, I oh, there's a Velvet Underground documentary. Have you seen it? We, we talk talked about, about that last week. The, you've seen the doc. No, I tried to see it, but I, I was unable to because the times were inconvenient. Okay. You can get it on Apple Plus. So we if we want to say that I will I will commit to seeing it by next week. We could say um, that. I could probably I could probably talk the wife into sitting through that with me. Um the the uh yeah, I, I do want to talk about car buying because I actually went into a dealership. I want to talk about how crazy the situation is right now if you're trying to buy a car. 
I, I suppose I'll try to tell another joke. I mean, by by you know, comment or consensus, you hold the current lead and best joke with your, I must say, vulgar and disgusting uh, Willie Nelson. And, and uh, you're joke. not the kind of guy who would like get all competitive and try to best me. Not but, at all. But I'm going to yeah, do it in a funny you're a way. Buddhist, Bob. I'm not going to try to out vulgar you. I'm gonna, I'm going to move into more and more heartwarming, if mildly vulgar humor. And, and try to best you. So I, like, I have a joke in mind. I tried. I tried you with the the John Wayne Bobbitt nun joke. Yeah. Nobody was buying it. I I still think that it's was, funny. So it's going to be like meta. It's going to be like Teilhard de Chardin walks into a bar. I guess that's one place you could go with happens? that. I just thought like if you got nuns and John Wayne Bobbitt, how can you go wrong humor wise? But everybody disagrees. Is there a strain of Buddhist humor, and is it funny? <laughs> <laughs> you can talk about that. Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, we should talk about Buddhism and retreats and stuff, just for the hell of it. Um, we need we and need I know a more there spiritual parrot room. We need a more spiritual parrot room. Um, uh, I know there were other things. It just seems like we... Yeah, there were. The, uh, there's a lot of good comments. There's a lot of like genius comments by commenters I want to talk about. The, you, there's this thing you denounce on Twitter called the pounce move, which I want to defend. Pounce move. Um, okay, I, I I thought actually thought my tweet might have been a little weak, but okay, good. Uh, I'm I'm here to reaffirm that intuition. <laughs> okay. Uh, um. The um. The um. But maybe this maybe the parrot room won't go two hours the way it did last week. That was a long parrot room, but. Uh, so, and I guess maybe I, I may have a little more to say about Alec Baldwin. Um, the, there's King Juan Carlos's sex drive that, that, uh, that came out. This surefire, week. surefire. I, I'm not, I haven't heard about it, but it, I, I, uh, if it's what you say, I love it. <laughs> um, there's, uh, there's the French wacky, that wacky French election that's happening. Um, uh, wow. You're ahead of me. It's because I read John Ellis's news items, Bob. That gives me all these. We all should. Topic we ideas. should read that. Cows Files newsletter, Non Zero newsletter. Those are the big three. There's um. Uh, there's uh, this weird, weird thing that happens when somebody else comes up with an idea and you completely agree with it, but it makes you deeply insecure and competitive. What 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 should we call that? Uh, from uh, my list? I don't know. Agree. But we'll uh, talk about it. Uh, paint, uh, agree, but insecure. Eh. Um, okay. So the parrot room, you know, is at patreon.com slash parrot room as the cool visual that should follow this, that uh, should, should be at the end of this video will uh, reinforce, uh, and people who want to support finer podcasters everywhere, actually not everywhere in the parrot room should go there. Um, also smash the like button, rate and review the right show. And again, if you're not reading cows files, um, well, how do you finish that sentence? Mickey, if you're not reading cows files, uh, Okay. You're not cool. I'll tell you, they say they say we've lost it, but no, sir. That was that was spontaneous. Mickey came up with that line. Spontaneous. You're not as cool as Kristen Cinema. Okay, you're getting better, but let's don't get too good because we saved the too good stuff for the parrot room. So we will uh, see you there shortly. See you there.